Um, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the guest speaker, uh, which is Julian Hunt, who is the uh, Emeritus Professor of Climate Modelling at the Department of Earth Sciences at UCL and a project advisor for the Global Systems Dynamics and Policies Project. He was Director General uh, and Chief Executive of the Meteorological Office from 92 to 97 and was created a baron in the House of Lords in the year 2000. Um, the respondent is uh, Michael Hallsworth, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Government. Uh, Michael is an author of several reports on better policy making, including the Mindspace report, uh, which has been adopted as the main framework for applying behavioural economics to public policy in the UK. Uh, recently, Michael produced a report for applying complexity theory to policy making called System of Stewardship. Okay, so uh, again, the same structure for, for the talk will be. Uh, Julian will talk for about 15 minutes uh, on the subject of policy development in the 21st century, after which Michael will respond for two to three minutes, uh, and, then, and then I'll open it up to the, uh, to the floor. So, uh, Julian, over to you. Uh, i just like, quickly say we have to finish five minutes early for this slot because Julian has to leave at, uh, I think, 5.25. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm off to give a talk about science and Charles Dickens. It's been 200th year, so uh, this is a warm-up, really. Uh, and uh, the, the, um, my interest in, in, um, in uh, systems really came about because uh, as a, a boy aged 11, I um, used to stay with my great uh, uncle, L.F. Richardson, Louis Fry Richardson, who was the person who sort of invented numerical weather forecasting. He wrote the book in 1922, and he had this idea that you'd fill the Albert Hall with 64,000 uh, mathematicians working away, and it would take three days to do one day's weather forecast. So therefore, it was considered to be rather a humorous idea, uh, of course, until... It, and he called the people computers, uh, until, of course, we had, had uh, electronic computers. But interestingly enough, he had the idea that actually human behavior, in various ways, you know, was also predictable. Uh, and he, um, in the First World War, he produced this famous sort of, you know, early system, the systems of what he called the Entente Cordiale, England and France and, and Germany. Uh, and he said there's a very simple differential equation that uh, would describe the way armaments animosity grow, that DAE by DT, that was the rate of increase of animosity of the Entente Cordiale, is equal to KAG, proportional to the animosity of the Germans, and vice versa. And, anybody, and uh, you're enough mathematicians here to know that the solution of that is exponentially growing, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, both of them grow exponentially. And then he showed, um, and he, of course he was in the First World War, he lost his manuscript of weather forecasting somewhere in the trenches because he was an ambulance driver, but then he wrote, he wrote about this, and then he plotted the graphs after the First World War, showed this exponential growth. 1933, he came along, and uh, he plotted the graph of armaments in Europe, and he said, uh, there's going to be another war. I mean, we see this exponential growth. And, and he wrote a letter to Nature in the days. Nature published rather well, more interesting letters, probably. Uh, and they said the, uh, the, the equation is simply that we shall have another war, uh, unless something is done, in which case you'll put another, another term into the equations. Um, and uh, he then had the idea that you have another term in the equations which was called submissiveness. So in other words, if you had an arms race and one, and one side was actually not arming as fast as the other one, because if they start with a small difference, the, the difference grows exponentially, then one side would give up. Um, now, in fact, of course, people didn't take his, him seriously. He said there was a war, Second World War. 1952, he said, now there's been three arms races this century, because this was the arms race after World War II. There have been two world wars. Is there any reason why there will not be a third world war? It's a nice little pithy letter to nature, you know. Uh, and um, he said, well, actually, there is, because of this phenomenon of submissiveness, which he quoted. And therefore, he assumed that, in fact, the, the two sides' armaments were growing asymmetrically, and one side would give up. So you could say 1952 in nature, you saw the end of the, end of the Cold War. So, um, so that was an example. But the, the interesting point about this was that, uh, uh, which really is what I want to say, was that systems dynamics is a way of idealizing the world in a way that you actually sort of, not you don't necessarily have to work on a historical basis. You can actually see how things emerge. Um, and uh, there are many ways in which, uh, in which uh, uh, systems uh, analysis works, partly by modeling techniques, partly by frameworks. And one of the important points is, of course, you can use it to pose questions. This is the word for policy. 
And that's a rather different philosophy to biological systems approach, uh, or in, some, in which you know you have, a, a, let's say, some cells or some, um, uh, or um, or some small species, some ecology, and you just want to study how that grows and how that develops. That's the sort of bottom up, you say. Whereas the the for policy, you often say, what is the question like? Is there going to be a, a war? Uh, and then you ask, what is the modeling needed to answer that question? Uh, one of the points about systems, is, in fact, we were just hearing in the pre previous talk, it's, it, it gives a lot of insights in periods of instability and uncertainty. It enables decision makers to decide what data they need. Um, it can also, of course, uh, and this is one of the exciting things, it can also begin to think about evolving systems, uh, which is, of course, one of the important, uh, important issues. So I just thought that if I, how do I change this thing forward? So if you, uh, we're going to think, where is a nice uh, description of the traditional methods of, um, uh, of uh, decision making? My father was a civil servant who studied inevitably classics at Oxford, uh, and, um, uh, and he said it was all, all, all in Thucydides, uh, uh, and uh, so that was the classical, and he, and he ran the British Empire in India, so, um, so that was history, and you consider the input data, the resources available, and you make ad hoc adjustments. And, and perhaps the best uh, and pithy account of traditional methods is in Hobbes, uh, who was very concerned about the policy issues of the English Civil War at that time, in the 1650s. So, for example, that kind of approach as it were, was used often for considering very major decisions. The big qualitative change, um, uh, the first qualitative change took place in the 19th century. You could say a lot of it took place at University College, um, where there was a room uh, in, the, in the Pearson building where, where Carl Pearson um, got a lot of people together with very early calculating machines and started grinding out statistics of government. You know, numbers of children who went up fireplaces and down the mines and all those sort of things. And that began to be an important thing. Now, if you look at, this is the question raised again by, 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 uh, uh, by, by Jamie McIntosh. What are the examinations taken by somebody entering the civil service? Nowadays, if somebody, you've got to be able to write, you've got to probably a bit of history. You've also got to know a bit about statistics. But you do not have to know anything about systems or networks unless you want to join MI6 or MI5. Um, and um, so there's a nice story of, um, I've forgotten his name now, anyway. so the, the man who was in charge of security at, uh, in, in the cabinet office uh, and was second head, ran G, GCHQ. Now he, uh, he was at Cambridge, so he wanted to join MI6. So they sent him off to some dingy, t dingy church hall in Cambridge where those sort of people set a, set a different exam. And in their examination, they sat there and they, and they were given a question, how do you work out the tram system of East European capital in 19... Sort of 67. So there were people who were believing in networks, you know, um, earlier, earlier on. But uh, the idea of system approaches, of course, came with uh, perhaps Walt Whitman and, and Smuts, who we've heard already this afternoon. He um, he actually uh, was in, was inspired by that. Uh, engineering and biology it emerged. Lord Shackleton suggested in the House of Lords that systems approach might be approaching useful in government. 1976. Somebody said at breakfast today, 20 years it'll happen. Well, that's uh, been more than 20 years. But uh, when we have different examinations and, and different uh, ways of presenting legislation, of course, we shall see um, systems. But of course, government is already, in fact, very, very well aware of the use of systems and, their, uh, uh, and very large models. Uh, the Treasury model is not discussed a lot in Parliament, but climate models are discussed endlessly uh, and their implications. Um, We've had models, uh, models uh, concerned with uh, foot and mouth disease and many other issues. Now, in such a complex system uh, as, as the climate, the way that the, the system model there is not one based upon the decision you're going to take. It's a bottom-up decision, like the biological system. You have a whole lot of processes, atmospheric physics, uh, uh, the, the cryosphere, the, um, <coughs> the ice, you consider clouds, ocean, all these processes. And all of these things are based upon upon physics. Now, the, the important point about this is that one of the things we know about is that we will expect the same laws of physics and chemistry and so on to apply to uh, 100, 200 years from now. So this is a, a basis for prediction. However, there, are, there is a nasty little box here called society. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, uh, and that of course makes, makes it much less predictable because um, 
Um, if you give a forecast for uh, what the climate will be, and then people actually stop driving, don't drive, continue to drive their cars, or don't drive their cars, or don't turn on their air conditioning, that makes a very big difference to the output of that system. So, so there's a big, as it, and there there's almost a feedback because people can see a climate model, and then they they are either going to respond to it or not respond to it, and that affects the answer. As per Lord, uh, Lord Desai commented, weather forecasting is much easier than economics because at least in weather forecasting, you're not quite sure about it, but the gods up there are not going to sort of change the weather in, in, in response to the weather forecast. If you make an economic forecast, however, people listen to the economic forecast and then do, do things that they weren't in the assumptions. So in other words, he said climate and weather forecasting is very easy. Uh, um, well, I've mentioned some of these processes here, um, and uh, that's a sort of a bit of a list of some of these kind of combination uh, of considering, in, uh, considering networks, considering subsystems. And one of the very important issues that we understand now is that even if you have each of the bits of the system working, uh, as, you, as you saw in that climate model, then the way they come together, or the way you put them together to make a decision, uh, is what you do in systems analysis. But that's a very complex process, and sometimes it will lead to very chaotic behavior. Sometimes it will lead to very regular behavior. Uh, this is why I had a slight uh, uh, disagreement with, with Greg at breakfast this morning, because one of the extraordinary things is some complex systems are very repeatable. For example, clouds. As, uh, Howard said in 1803, you look at the sky, you might think it would be completely different all the time, the sport of winds, but you keep getting cumulus, cloud stratus, clouds, cumulonimbus clouds, incredibly complex, keep repeating. So there are very complex systems that actually, and that's, an, that's as it were, an example of a godic system. But there are other ones, you know, which will suddenly veer off and do something quite different. And one of the points about system thinking is to help you understand what that is. Now, if you're a, if you're a, uh, cons uh, so, as it were, a, uh, a civil servant or a, a businessman in old way, you say, look, I have problems, I have techniques. And the question is, um, there are old problems and old techniques. Then you have new problems. So climate change is a, is a, is a, is a, is a big example. Um, or a new problem might be, can we predict uh, and, uh, as it were, stimulate innovation? I mean, a really different, a new sort of problem. And of course, the old techniques of the historical or simply number crunching won't answer that question. So you go, therefore, from a new problem, obviously, to a new technique. Um, and one of the interesting points, of course, is that you might find a method that dealt with one problem, and some of these new techniques may well be useful for other problems. Uh, and of course, system dynamics is generally in this box here. And of course, in some cases, it then enables us to go back and look at old methods. Um, or of, of, of new scenarios. So a lot of the old problems that we had, which we thought we'd, be get, we'd as it were, adjusted to, we may well be able to improve. A, a, a very good example of this is project management. And I think it's one of the, one of the sensational uh, applications of system methods over the last 50 years. Most projects were, on, were late and were, were very, very uh, um, erratic. For example, now when the Met Office moved uh, from Bracknell to Exeter, the computers moved. The, the, the weather forecasts all arrived exactly on time after they moved. That, that's called project management by meteorologists, you see. So it's probably better than, uh, than others, anyway. Um, um, the, 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 the other, the other uh, as it were, just, just a couple of, of points is that, um, of course, GSDB con concepts can be applied to a variety, a variety of problems. And one of the ones, well, for example, the EU was saying, which is an interesting question. Is there a system way of answering the question whether the Tobin frictional tax would actually make the financial systems in, in the uh, more or less stable? The British government's view was that this was part of terrible interference. Uh, but interestingly, economists were undecided, at least in my polling of economists in the House of Lords, as to whether or not they did expect this. So that's an interesting area, of course. In energy, one of the interesting things about, about system approaches is that um, what we should be doing is be, as it were, uh, and we discussed this this afternoon, using this sort of modeling of scenarios to look at the whole range of options. Sadly, what governments do is they say, this is our policy, yes, so much percentage wind, so much percentage nuclear, etc. And then suddenly, like in Germany, whoop, they suddenly change to that. Was what we should be doing is we having, should be having plan A, plan B, plan C, and we should be using system methods to look under what factors we will be flipping from one to the other. Um, 
one of the things I was going to say was that um, uh, a, a simple model, which I'm sure you all know about, of traffic jams. Now, it's a beautiful example, particularly it comes from fluid mechanics, which is my, which is my base subject. Uh, um, now, if you flow along a river, and the flow is going slowly, and there's a stone in the river, then the flow adjusts. It's all very smooth. But if the flow is going fast along the river and you have a big rock, then suddenly you'll have waves ahead of it. In other words, the flow will not know that there's a rock until it reaches there. Then you have waves. That's exactly the same in traffic. If the traffic is going slowly, you adjust to some traffic jam ahead. If the traffic is going fast, you're going actually faster than the, than the information speed goes back down the, the traffic and you get a set of traffic jams. This model applies in many other systems. Um, it, it applies in business systems. In fact, what it's really saying to you is, are you acting faster or slower than the information speed is moving? And if you're acting faster than the information speed, then you get a, a crash. Uh, and therefore, what can a manager do is to see whether, in some sense, looking at his system, is, are people doing things slowly or fast? So if you have a, an old-fashioned bureaucracy in which people move files up and down the corridors, um, then no, there can be no surprises because the information is going so slow, you know, you, <laughs> you're having all these very slow actions. However, uh, but this is actually quite, I, I explained this idea to a psychiatrist, uh, a very distinguished president of psychiatrist. It seems to me the human brain and happiness is when you are doing, receiving information at the same time, you can, same speed you can process it. If you're, if you're able to process information much faster, life is very boring. You know? But if, you can, if, you, if you're doing too many things to process, you crash. So happiness is when you're right on that button. As you know, fashionable, it's very fashionable now to find theories of happiness. So this is the system theory of happiness. You can take that away with you this afternoon, uh, uh, all, for f all for free. Um, uh, so the, 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 um, the other application, uh, just to show you the, the world we're in now, this was in the Financial Times in, in, uh, in October. Where they were, this was the first big system network diagram I'd seen in the Financial Times describing, instead of a long, complicated uh, article, they said, Boop, here it is, here's the, here's the diagram, you see. Euro breakup, UK recession, feedback loop. We won't go through it, and I wouldn't be able to speak very expertly about this. But I thought it was very interesting that we, 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 there are enough readers of the Financial Times now who are who are system networkers, that that's the way they want to receive their information. It would be nice if we saw, had a few acts of parliament in the same, in the same, <laughs> in the same uh, direction. Um, we will eventually. Um, and uh, the, the area that I'm very interested in is another area of, 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 um, of, sort of complex uh, sort of modeling and, and then finally going right down to sort of, sort of providing information to people at an individual level is that we now know, of course, that the Heat island in, in cities is rising, um, and it's a, it's a complex process, uh, and it's particularly strong in the evenings. But it's very different. You'll have a couple of degrees difference between Regent's Park and Primrose Hill, uh, down at the Olympics the Stadium, where people, my, uh, my company in Cambridge, uh, has been doing modelling of the, the, the local environment, how the temperature is different, where there's a lot of water and green space, different to where there's high buildings. So in fact, this is, you, know, you can begin to be able to, estate agents might be interested in this in the future or where you live, also health and hospitals. But the, 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 the uh, interesting point is that um, the pollution is associated with this. You will, already in London, there are 7,000 people who receive every day information uh, in their street where they live about air pollution. What we want to do in future is actually to find out what their particular sensitivities are so that we ought to send individualized forecasts. So that's an example of, uh, of, of developing systems based upon a lot of feedback from people and um, so we can individualize it. So the role of computers um, uh, and people uh, and the system modeling will have all sorts of benefits right down to some of the most essentially vulnerable people in our community. Thank you very much.